Muy buenos días. Voy a presentar al doctor Anthony Barley. Él es asistente profesor en la Escuela de Matemáticas y Ciencias Naturales en la Universidad Estatal de Arizona, ASU. Él obtuvo su grado en la Universidad Estatal de California, Sacramento, y su doctorado en Ecología y Biología Evolutiva en la Universidad de Kansas. Su investigación doctoral se enfocó en la sistemática y evolución de las lagartijas filipinas. Después del doctorado, realizó una estancia postdoctoral en la Universidad de Hawái, donde, donde empezó su colaboración con la evolución de anfibios y reptiles en México. Durante esa estancia, obtuvo el financiamiento de Arnold and Mabel Beckman Foundation. Antes de empezar su posición actual en 2022, realizó una segunda estancia postdoctoral en la Universidad de California, Davis. Su actual investigación está enfocada en la evolución de las lagartijas cola de látigo, o bueno, así fue la traducción, en realidad es whiptail, de Norteamérica, que involucra trabajo de campo y colaboración con científicos del suroeste de Estados Unidos, México y Guatemala. Y sin más, le doy la bienvenida al profesor Anthony Barley. Ok, um, muchas gracias por la invitación um, y disculpe porque mi español es muy mal. So I'm going to speak in English. Um, but um, thank you all very much for coming and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I've been to UNAM before um, to visit um, my collaborator, Adrián Nieto, um, but uh, I've definitely met a lot more folks this time and it's been really fun to um, yeah interact with everyone. So thank you for having me and um, for, uh, yeah. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, so yeah, today what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the research that I've been doing um, on whiptail lizards over the past few years from the southwestern U.S. and, um, and from Mexico. Um, and so um, this group of lizards, if, if you uh, all are not herpetologists and you've heard of them, you've probably heard of them because they're re a really unique group of lizards um, that's the largest group of unisexual vertebrates. Um, we're going to start talking about them today from a bit more of a historical perspective. Um, and so kind of the reason why biologists were initially interested in wh whiptail lizards was not because of, of these unique reproductive modes that they have, but actually because uh, biologists were interested in them from a systematics perspective. Um, and in particular, interested in why their systematics was so difficult to resolve. And so the title of my talk, as well as the quote that I put up here from a, a manuscript uh, from 1962, illustrates some of the challenges that biologists have had trying to understand their systematics. When uh, Duhlman and his wife equated uh, understanding the systematics of whiptail lizards to um, Shakespeare's King Lear play and him uh, leading um, uh, the blind, uh, his people. Um, as a kind of mad king. Um, and this is just one of many colorful quotes um, from the historical literature on the systematics of whiptail lizards. Um, starting in 1900, Edward Drinker Cope famously referred to um, the systematics of whiptails as the most difficult problem in herpetology. Um, and then in 1906, um, kind of a next study of the Mexican lizards of this genus was done by Hans Gatto. Um, and we start to understand a little bit more about why are these, these lizards so difficult to understand from a systematics perspective. And Gatto talks about how plastic and variable many of the populations are of these species um, and suggests that no two taxonomic uh, authorities could possibly ever agree on the systematics of whiptail lizards. So I took that as a challenge. Um, but he also um, talks about how uh, while they may be a really challenging group to understand, they're also really interesting because they're um, in this kind of unsettled condition, they're uh, an ideal object lesson, lesson in nature's way of species making. Um, and then finally, I'll finish up with a, a couple more quotes from Duhlman and Zweifel, who suggested a, a few different things in their study of the systematics of um, the whiptail lizards. One, um, they suggested that some of the specimens they examined um, essentially introduced so much confusion, it almost destroyed their face in biological principles. Um, one of the really challenging groups of lizards um, that within this uh, group, one of the species complexes, they, they suggested that they weren't even sure whether many of the individuals that they assigned to that group could be assigned to the same species. 
Um, and even if they did, they weren't quite sure about whether or not this was the correct name. And then I think one last really interesting um, thing to remember here is that all of these um, quotes from these papers studying the systematics of whiptail lizards that I mentioned all occurred before we knew um, anything about unisexual reproduction in these whiptail lizards. Um, and so in their, uh, this was in the early 1960s, right when um, biologists were just starting to hypothesize that unisexual reproduction in squamates might exist. Um, and um, they kind of suggested that if it is established that parthenogenesis or re uh, unisexual reproduction does occur in this genus, um, this group that's already been notoriously difficult for understanding its taxonomy will, of course, be um, subject to additional complications. I um, will noted that uh, Bill Duhlman actually really didn't want to put this line in the paper because at the time he like wouldn't believe, even though biologists were kind of uh, reporting that they were finding populations of species that didn't appear to have any males. Uh, he was just kind of convinced that if we looked hard enough, we'd find them. And there's just no way that um, there are lizards that um, reproduce um, without having sex. So um, before I get started, um, I just want to say that none of this work would have been possible without uh, a lot of really great collaborators, um, uh, both across the US and here in Mexico. Uh, most importantly, um, Adrian Nieto, your colleague, also known as the godfather of Mexican lizards. Um, without his uh, help on this, we, we really wouldn't know anywhere near what we do about uh, what would tail lizards, and we really wouldn't have been able to accomplish a lot of, a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today. Um, as well as a lot of, of great biologists who've helped uh, collect a lot of specimens over the years um, that we've used in our research. All right, so let's summarize a little bit here and talk about all right, what is it exactly that causes whiptail lizards to destroy our faith in biological principles? Well, one is uh, what um, Gatto first uh, alluded to, right? This extreme morphological variation in plasticity that we see among populations. Another is that speciation among these lizards appears to not be complete. So we have populations of lizards um, between which they are diverging, but still there is some level of kind of reproductive connection between them. There's also this weird reproductive mode variation. So a full one third of the species diver uh, diversity of these lizards appears to be comprised of species that are unisexual. So populations of entirely female individuals that reproduce by cloning themselves. Um, and then finally, hybridization. Um, and so whiptail lizards, like almost all vertebrates that are um, unisexual, appear to form by hybridization. Um, and so we think this generally works when we have sexual species of whiptail lizards that come into contact in nature, they produce hybrid offspring. And in those hybrid offspring, we have a transition of reproductive mode from going from sexual reproduction to being able to reproduce unisexually. Um, what's really interesting about these lizards is that not only are there diploid unisexual species that have one copy of their genome from two different sexual species, but we also have triploid species, species with three different copies of their genome. And largely what we think, how we think those species form is by a process we call genome addition, where these diploid unisexual species back cross with another unisexual species to form a triploid unisexual species. So totally wacky biology. Um, and it turns out that a lot of this um, kind of the interesting part of the story today relates to this process of hybridization. So when I started working on the systematics or on these lizards, I really thought the questions we were going to be addressing were about um, systematics and evolutionary history um, and about uh, weird changes in reproductive mode. But it turns out a lot of our story today is kind of related to the process of hybridization. Um, and so it turns out when we think about um, this process of hybridization, the interbreeding between distinct species, um, historically, when we thought about that process, we thought about it something that's really rare in the process of speciation, right? So this is a figure from DeCaros' 1998 paper on species concepts, um, and we've largely thought about kind of hybridization between species as something that maybe occurs very rarely as species are early on in their divergence, um, but that over time um, that stops, um, and that's kind of a, the end of the story. But over the past few years, we've been uh, starting to realize that a wide variety of things can happen when two species come into contact and produce hybrid offspring. So one of those things is intergressive hybridization. So species can exchange alleles through interbreeding over time. Um, so right. So if you're familiar with um, the fact that many populations of humans have Neanderthal DNA in their genomes, uh, that's there through this process of uh, interbreeding over time as humans migrated out of Africa and interbred with Neanderthals, they exchanged parts of their genome. 
right? So that's one possibility. Um, another possibility is lineage fusion or speciation collapse. So populations that have, have diverged historically come back into contact um, and kind of fuse into a single gene pool, right? Um, whereas with intergressive hybridization, typically what we see is those two species remain distinct, but they exchange small parts of their genome. And then the last kind of outcome of hybridization we can see is um, hybrid speciation, where um, those hybrid offspring that are produced actually result in the formation of an entirely new third species that comes into existence alongside those two species that already exist. And so today we're going to be trying to think and understand a lot about what determines why we see these different outcomes of hybridization, right? These are all different processes that are essentially initiated by the same thing, the production of hybrid offspring. And largely what we'll learn is that the difference comes down to um, kind of what's going on with those hybrid offspring after they are produced. Um, and so just to give you a brief, brief outline of the research I'm going to talk about today, it's kind of two main questions that the research is focused on that we're going to be trying to understand. So one question that I, I've always been really interested in is just trying to understand why are the whiptail lizards the largest group of unisexual vertebrates? And then um, once I learned that it was kind of a story about hybridization, I wanted to try to understand um, to what extent are the outcomes of hybridization and the consequences of these transitions in reproductive mode um, contingent versus deterministic. And that by that, I mean, are kind of these outcomes of hybridization predictable beforehand, or do they depend on some kind of historical contingent series of events to happen, right? And so to answer those questions, we're gonna be using the whiptail lizards as a model. And in order to answer those two big questions, we really need to know three big things about them. One is that we need to know about their evolutionary history, which means we need to know about the boundaries between the species, the sexual and the unisexual species. We need to understand what the patterns of hybridization are between species. And we need to understand, uh, once we have this kind of evolutionary framework, we can start asking these questions and trying to understand what determines um, why we see these different outcomes of hybridization. So um, to make progress on this first question, um, we've really been investing in a large number of things. Um, that's um, sampling, um, in part due to Adrian's work um, on these lizards for um, over two decades. Um, but also more recently, we've been doing um, uh, an, a, a bunch of additional field work across Mexico and the southwestern US. Um, in the process of that, we've sampled over 500 localities for this research um, uh, across all the different, essentially all the different described taxa and all the geographic regions for a bunch of different species. Um, the data and the results I'm going to show you today are mostly based on RADSeq data. Um, so um, the uh, data sets are about comprised of about 60,000 genetic loci. And then more recently, we've um, been trying to develop some additional kind of chromosome levels genome assemblies. Um, so we've made some progress on, on developing quite a few, and we have a few more in, prog in progress you know, through a combination of sequencing technologies. So um, one of the really big things that um, these huge genomic data sets have allowed us to do is identify, um, one, the kind of really divergent um, lineages of whiptail lizards, right? So we can use our genomic data, build a big phylogeny for all the species of, of whiptail lizards that look something like this, where we have kind of a um, kind of lineage, uh, a kind of uh, each of these triangles kind of representing a, a really divergent lineage of whiptail lizards, right? But in addition to being able to um, kind of build trees, the other thing that having all this genomic data has allowed us to do is better understand why the taxonomic boundaries between these populations are so difficult. Um, so if we zoom in on, on these clays, what we see is, is a, a consistent pattern where we have um, kind of divergence of populations in different geographic regions, but continued kind of um, gene flow and um, reproductive connections between them. So um, this is just kind of a figure illustrating one of the um, kind of species complexes of these lizards that we've been really struggling to try to understand. Right, these are our samples of these lizards, um, which uh, may correspond to um, one, to a bunch of different species, we're not quite sure yet. Um, but what we see is if we look in distinct areas, there's huge morphological variation. So these are just um, kind of pictures illustrating some of the uh, morphological variation among the um, kind of uh, adults of these populations, right? And there's just like crazy, like really neat morphological variation between um, these different populations in terms of what they look like, right? And so there's a lot of genetic divergence in distinct regions, um, but there's also appears to be where those populations kind of come into contact, a lot of kind of intergradation 
right? Um, and so what we kind of are seeing here is, is populations of these sexual lizards um, spanning the speciation continuum of divergence, which is what makes it so difficult to understand the boundaries between them. So now uh, kind of with that data, right, we're starting to feel a little better about understanding the boundaries between the sexual species of, of whiptail lizards. Um, there's still a lot to for us to kind of figure out the, on the end. Um, but now I want to turn to a little bit of our kind of work on trying to understand the boundaries between the unisexual species, right? Um, which really comes down to um, the first question we have is kind of what is a unisexual species of lizards, right? So if you think about a unisexual species of lizards, every individual in that population is reproductively isolated from each other, right? Every single female is essentially cloning herself and not having sex with another individual. They don't form lineages like sexual species of organisms typically do, right? Um, and so the way we're going to be talking about the diversity of the unisexual species is essentially based on their sexual ancestors, right? So again, the way these species form is that we have gene pools, populations of sexual lizards that have different genome compositions, hybridized to produce unisexual populations um, that have combinations of genomes from those two species. And so when I'm talking about unisexual species of lizards today, what I'm talking about is populations of lizards that have distinct combinations of genetic ancestry from different sexual species, right? And so essentially our research um, on this front is really asking the question, how many different genome copies does a unisexual population have from distinct sexual species? And so to illustrate those results, I'm gonna be showing you um, some structure plots. These are um, plots where we have bars that represent data for individuals. The different colors are estimates of genomic ancestry. Right, and so what we'll see is what we should see, right, is these these uh, sexual parents have distinct colors or distinct sources of genetic ancestry, and we expect the ancestry of the unisexual populations to be mixed, right? And so um, what we see is that with the unisexual species, numerous lineages derive their ancestry from um, unique combinations of sexual species. So what we see is there's about appears to be ten different sexual lineages. Um, that uh, are from which the unisexual species are derived. Um, so this is a oh, this is a phylogeny of the sexual species, and these arrows represent the parents of those unisexual species. You can see they come from a bunch of different parts of the whiptail phylogeny, um, and I've represented their ancestry with different colors here. And so what we see is there's um, there appear to be six different diploid unisexual species. So those are unisexual species with two copies of their genome. And these are estimates of their genetic ancestry, right? So we estimate about half their genome as being derived from one of those two sexual parents. And you see there's a bunch of different combinations from which they've been produced. And then there's uh, kind of four different populations of triploid unisexual species that have different compositions of um, genetic ancestry. So in some cases, those um, lizards have two copies of their genome from one species and one um, from another species. But in some cases, we have triploid species that have three different genomes that are combined into a single individual lizard, right? So totally weird. And just to kind of, um, I think one of the things that's hard to convey with those structure plots is just like how crazy this actually is. So this is a paper that Adriana and I published a couple of years ago. Um, on a um, species we described from Sonora, Mexico. And what we found was what we thought was the diploid ancestor of one of the triploid species of whiptail lizards, right? And so um, another way of kind of another another way you can kind of visual visualize those genetic ancestries is not by looking at different colors, but looking at different sets of chromosomes, right? So these are karyotypes from our paper um, showing the distinction between um, a diploid species and a triploid species that derive their ancestry from two different sexual species. So Aspidocillus arizoni and Aspidocillus berti. And with that karyotype data, we can see that Preopitae, the species we described, has one set of chromosomes from arizoni and one set from berti. Whereas Opitae, um, its uh, progenitor, has two sets of, of chromosome copies from Aspidocillus berti and one from arizoni, right? So it's kind of neat to be able to just see those chromosomes from different sexual species combined into a single individual. All right, so that's one way of describing um, the unisexual species diversity. Um, one question you might have is, are those unisexual populations always perfect clones of each other? 
Um, the answer to that is no. Um, and there's two other ways we can think about understanding the diversity of the unisexual populations, right? There's two different ways which diversity um, can be generated in a unisexual population. So one of them is through post-formational mutation. Essentially, we have sexual species that hybridize to produce that unisexual clone. Um, and then we maybe have a mutation in one population that causes those populations to differ and become teenage mutant ninja turtle or ninja lizards, I guess we would call them, right? So that's one way in which we can see diversity in those unisexual populations following after they for, uh, forming after they uh, being generated after they form. Another way we can have diversity generated is through multiple hybrid origins. So we can have the same two sexual species but different individuals of those sexual species hybridizing to produce two different unisexual populations that essentially have the same ancestry, but that ancestry is derived from distinct different individuals in that population, right? We can have males and uh, female, the males and females of those sexual um, species can be reversed in that uh, hybrid cross essentially. Um, and so we've been um, trying to quantify that using demographic modeling and our genomic data. What we can do is set up two different demographic models, right? So those are different processes by which those populations form. And we can use um, model testing to um, kind of identify what is the most likely demographic history for those populations. And when we do that, what we see is that much more diversity is generated by hybridization than post-formational mutation. So these are all of our diploid unisexual species. In gray, we have them being separated if they form from different hybrid parents. And then I've colored these different colors. So in blue, we have diversity that's generated by post-formational mutation. And in red, we have those clones that have the same parents, but are derived from different hybridization events, right? So if you look at the branch lengths here, you can see that those clones that are formed by distinct hybridization events are much more divergent from each other than those um, individuals within a population that essentially that diversity is generated by post-formational mutation. All right, um, so in summary to our um, kind of first question, right? There's at least 33 sexual species of whiptail lizards. We're still kind of trying to finalize and, and work out the boundaries between them, but we have a much better idea um, than we did 30 to 40 years ago when we didn't have genomic information, which is exciting. Um, and there's at least 11 different unisexual lineages of species that have distinct combinations of ancestry from sexual species. All right, so the next thing we need to know is what are the patterns of hybridization between species, right? And so in the first part of my talk, I kind of, we were able to resolve the patterns of hybridization of hybrid speciation, right? When we're looking at those unisexual lizards and we've uh, kind of resolved their ancestry, we understand the um, sexual species from which they are derived by hybridization, right? But one of the things that we didn't really expect um, when we started studying the systematics of these lizards was just how common intergressive hybridization or gene exchange is between the sexual species of whiptail lizards. And so one of the ways we can um, test for that is using our genomic data. And so what I'm gonna show you is a summary of tests for intergression that we did across all the different species of, of sexual whiptail lizards. So what we do here is on our left, we have a phylogeny that we've generated based on the genomic data that we have. We can build a phylogeny. And then what we do is we look across the genome of all our different sexual species and look for patterns that are discordant with how they are related in that phylogeny, right? In those um, kind of discordant patterns in particular, we're looking for patterns that are discordant in ways that are suggestive of intergressive hybridization or gene exchange between species. And so these are pairwise tests for intergression across all the different combination of species and branches in our phylogeny. In red, we have um, branches or species that are um, strongly indicative of gene exchange or intergressive hybridization with statistically significant tests um, with uh, denoted by asterisks. And so there's a, a couple things that are really interesting. So one is just, it was surprising how many different combinations of sexual whiptails we found that appear to have evidence of gene exchange. But another is just kind of how striking some of those patterns we found were. So we actually see evidence of intergression from two, uh, between two different species of sexual whiptails um, from Southern Mexico in Oaxaca, um, Espidocellus mexicanus and Espidocellus sacci. And these species are, hugely morphologically different. You can see based on the photos. I um, mean, you can also see that based on these scaled photographs, just how different they are in body size, right? It's wild that these two species could 
uh, could possibly even interbreed, much less exchange genes to the extent that we see them, uh, we see evidence for. One of the really neat things about having all these different um, combinations of hybridization um, in whiptails is that they allow us to um, kind of test some classic patterns of speciation, right? Um, and in particular, try to understand the relationship between gene exchange and divergence time. So this is a plot from um, kind of Jerry Coyne and Alan Orr's um, classic work on speciation, where uh, in fruit flies, they were looking at the amount of reproductive isolation there is between species and laboratory crosses as a function of their divergence time. So our x-axis here is the genetic distance, which is a proxy for divergence time between species of fruit flies. And our y-axis is a measure of reproductive isolation between them, right? And so there's a strong correlation as species diverge, um, reproductive isolation increases, right? So this is a laboratory crossing experiment. Um, but what this predicts is that in nature, we should also see decreased intergression between species as they diverge. Because as species become more evolutionarily divergent, it becomes more difficult for them to produce viable and fertile offspring, which is required for this process of gene exchange, right? And what's pretty rad is that we actually see really strong evidence for that in the whiptails, right? So here we're looking at all those different pairs of sexual species between which we detect evidence of intergression. We use our phylogeny to estimate the evolutionary divergence between those species, that's our, our x-axis, in our y-axis, we're using a measure of the proportion of the genome that they share, a measure of gene exchange. We see a really strong correlation as we'd predict, right? As species diverge, they ex exchange smaller and smaller parts of their genome, which is pretty cool. All right. So we now know that hybridization between whiptail lizards is really common. And what we want to do is try to understand the uh, what causes those different hybridization outcomes, right? In order to do that, we need to kind of move from thinking in a kind of framework of understanding evolutionary history as a tree to moving to understanding it using more of a network structure, right? Because when we have hybridization between species, we end up with individuals or species in our in our um, within our group that have combinations of ancestry that's directly derived from multiple other species, right? So rather than um, in a tree-based kind of evolutionary history where each individual has a single um, kind of genetic ancestor, right? When these parthenogenetic lineages, right? They have ancestry that is derived directly from multiple other species, right? So we need to understand that history using a network structure. Um, and so if we do that for all of the whiptails, so this is a really challenging thing to do. And this is kind of a summary of a bunch of different analyses we did to try to understand these different patterns of gene exchange. Um, in bold, we have the unisexual species. I've also denoted them with asterisks, right? So you can see in black, we have the kind of tree-like um, uh, parts of evolutionary history um, that describe how species are related to each other. And then these dashed lines represent those hybridization events. And I've color-coded them according to the process they represent, right? So in red, we have gene exchange um, between uh, sexual species through hybridization. In blue, we have those hybridization events um, that lead to the formation of diploid unisexual species through a change in reproductive mode to unisexual reproduction. And in purple, we have those genome addition events the, that lead to the evolution of those triploid unisexual species. So um, it's, a really, uh, it's really exciting that we kind of have these methods to help us understand the evolutionary history of, of these lizards much better now. Um, and it's just like uh, kind of a crazy visualization of, of evolutionary history, right? Um, but I also have struggled a lot with trying to think about, uh, again, how to convey just how really interesting this is, right? To, to try to understand kind of how can we think about those patterns of evolutionary history in these lizards? And so what I decided that is, I think the best way to understand it is to think about this from the perspective of primates, since we're primates, right? So we have examples of unisexual species that are formed by hybridization between really divergent sexual species, right? To the extent that um, you can think about this as the equivalent of if Tom Cruise went ahead and mated with a gibbon um, and produced an offspring that could then clone itself, right? I don't, I don't know what that would look like, but I asked an AI art generator to tell me what that would look like, and that's apparently what it looks like. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about diploid unisexual lizards, right? When we're talking about triploid unisexual lizards, what we're really talking about is what, if that kind of hybrid uh, lizard backcrossed with a gorilla to create a triploid, right? And this is what our 
our AI art generator thinks that would look like, right? So totally crazy biology. All right, so um, we've kind of finished up with our second question here, understanding what are the patterns of hybridization? We, we found that there's integration between about 12 different pairs of sexual species. And we see within those unisexual populations, there's um, at least nine different examples of transitions in reproductive mode and seven different instances of ploidy elevation. All right, so now that we understand a lot better their evolutionary history, we can start asking the question of what determines why these different outcomes of hybridization occur. Um, so when we think about trying to understand why unisexual lizards form upon hybridization, there's kind of three hypotheses that have been proposed for why this is the case. And so we can now use our data to try to distinguish between these three things. So one of them is referred to as the phylogenetic constraint hypothesis. Essentially, this hypothesizes that um, the reason that unisexual lizards form upon hybridization is essentially related to special traits that certain sexual species of lizards have, right? Um, essentially, maybe there's there's just certain individuals that when they, uh, certain species that when they hybridize, they can produce these unisexual species, right? It's like a magic trait, maybe. A second hypothesis is called the balance hypothesis. Essentially, this uh, hypothesis proposes that um, unisexual species form when the hybridizing parents are at intermediate levels of divergence. And the reason um, that the kind of theory behind this hypothesis is essentially that this is a balance. It's a balance between as species diverge from each other, they become more capable of their hybrid offspring um, producing unreduced gametes, because that's essentially what has to happen for those unisexual species to be able to clone themselves. They have to produce eggs that are not haploid, but are actually diploid, right? Um, which is not how it occurs in sexual species. And that's a balance against the fact that as species diverge, it's much more likely that those hybrid offspring will experience reductions in viability or fecundity, right? And so at some intermediate le level of divergence, there's more likely we're going to get those hybrid offspring producing unreduced gametes, um, but they're still probably not going to be completely sterile or inviable, right? And then the last hypothesis we can refer to as the rare formation hypothesis, which is really just an elaboration on these two. It's like, essentially, maybe one of these is true, but uh, there's additional factors that are also important in determining when unisexual species are produced. And so... If we um, use our data to do that, the first thing we did was try to test this phylogenetic constraint hypothesis. And the way we did that was looking for phylogenetic signal in the parental status of those sexual species. And when we do that, we see no evidence for um, phylogenetic constraint, right? We, we essentially, if we model unisexual parental status as a um, binary trait on the whiptail phylogeny, we see no phylogenetic signal for that trait. And we see that only two of those 10 sexual species have been involved in more than one transition from sexual to unisexual reproduction. So essentially very little evidence that it's kind of a magic trait in that it matters who the parent is. In contrast, we see really strong evidence for the balance hypothesis. So what we're looking here, what we're looking at here is the evolutionary divergence between sexual species of lizards that hybridize. And we've essentially separated out on our x-axis those two different um, outcomes of hybridization. In red, we have pairs of species that hybridize and exchange genes through integration. And in blue, we have those pairs of species that produce unisexual lineages, right? And so what we see is a really strong signal, right? All those species that exchange genes are much more closely related to each other. And all those species that are parents of unisexual species are much more distantly related to each other, right? Um, I should say that it's not quite that simple. Um, there are lots of examples of sexual species that are kind of within these ranges of divergence that are sympatric, between which we don't see um, unisexual uh, clones being produced, right? So there's probably some element of the rare formation um, hypothesis that's important that we don't quite understand yet. All right, so another kind of outcome of hybridization we can think about is, is genetic variation. Right, so what happens, do these hybridization processes have predictable um, impacts on genetic variation? And the answer to that is also yes. What we're doing here is looking at measures of genetic variation between different types of species. 
In blue, we're looking at measures of genetic variation in the parthenogenetic species. And then in red and black, we're looking at sexual species, but separating them out based on whether or not they have a history of intergressive hybridization. Right, and so um, parthenogenetic species have uh, very high elevated heterozygosity, right? And that's essentially because they're um, F1 clones of uh, hybrid offspring, right? So because they're formed from divergent sexual species, they have very high genetic diversity, and that diversity is essentially frozen in time as they close them, clone themselves. But we also see elevated genetic diversity in the sexual um, species that have a history of hybridization. And in some cases, we think that's related to the fact that some of the sexual um, populations have um, had multiple hybrid partners on different time scales, right? So clearly, hybridization is really important in dictating the genetic diversity in these species, and different speciation processes affect genetic diversity in different ways, right? So um, maybe what you're asking yourself at this point is why the hell are there so many unisexual whiptail lizards when they have no genetic recombination? Um, so if you think a lot about um, kind of sex evolution theory, right, we know that without um, sex, we have no genetic recombination. If you have no genetic recombination, two things should be true. One is that you should accumulate deleterious mutations due to Muller's ratchet. And the other is that species should not be able to adapt to changing environments, right? The kind of red queen hypothesis proposed by Van Valen in the 1970s, right? So species that don't have sex and can't recombine their genome should be at a significant um, disadvantage compared to sexual species. And because of that, eventually this should drive them to extinction, right? What's really cool about um, the data we have is that um, while it's surprising that there are so many unisexual whiptail lizards, our data actually prove um, essentially and are consistent with this theory, right? And the reason for that is if we look at the ages of the sexual species, they're much older than the unisexual species. So here's an estimate of unisexual, or sorry, of sexual whiptail evolutionary history, right? You can see a kind of uh, estimate of divergence time between those sexual populations, right? And we have some of these species that have been around for millions of years. But if we use our data to try to estimate the ages of the unisexual species, we see that they are much younger, right? So essentially these are age estimates for all the diploid unisexual species based on our genomic data. And you can see that all these estimates fall within the past few hundred thousand years, right? So all of them are formed very recently. And essentially what we kind of think this shows is the diversity we see today is essentially a snapshot of species that have formed recently, but just haven't gone extinct, right? Likely, there have been many different um, species of unisexual lizards that have been formed throughout the history, the 20 million year history of the whiptails. But the only species we see left are those that have just kind of formed recently and haven't quite gone extinct due to these constraints of um, a lack of genetic recombination. All right, so um, to quickly summarize the answer to our kind of two questions today, right? What we wanted to know is, why are these whiptail lizards the largest group of unisexual vertebrates? Well. I think the answer is twofold. One is that they maintain reproductive compatibility and the ability to hybridize across huge timescales, right? Tom Cruise versus a given, right? Like crazy timescales across which we're seeing hybridization. Um, we also see that there's been numerous recent opportunities for hybridization between divergent species, right? And that's why we see the kind of diversity that we see today. Our second question is about whether or not these outcomes of hybridization are um, contingent or deterministic or predictable, right? Um, well, we see that these outcomes of hybridization deterministically or predictably depend on the divergence time between species, right? Both in terms of the amount of your genome that you, that you exchange through intergressive hybridization, but also through your propensity to produce unisexual species upon hybridization. We also see that unisexual species appear to predictably face extinction due to a lack of genetic recombination. All of the unisexual species of, of whiptails are very young. Um, and then lastly, um, I also mentioned, right, that reproductive mode transitions do also seem to be quite rare given the amount of opportunity there is for hybridization in these lizards. So they must depend on some factors that are probably contingent that we don't quite understand yet. So there's still a lot to learn. Um, and so I'll finish up today um, just by mentioning a little bit of the kind of future directions of what we're working on. Um, so there's a lot of work um, to continue on kind of the work I've presented today. Um, but um, some of the things we've learned about whiptails um, caused me to question if we've learned anything at all, really, 
Um, and so there's three different things that um, I thought when kind of after we uh, kind of finished a lot of this work, I thought we knew about these lizards. So one is that I thought that the unisexual species form by a stepwise process of hybridization and ploidy elevation to triploidy, right? That process of hybrid speciation I outlined for you. Uh, another was that I thought unisexual whiptails have frozen genomes with high heterozygosity. And the other was that um, we largely thought of reproductive modes as fixed traits within whiptails. Either you reproduce parthenogenetically or you reproduce sexually. You can't do both. And so um, a few things have happened in uh, the past few months that have made me rethink these. So one is that a collaborator of mine was able to create tetraploid hybrids in a lab, right? Um, so um, when I started this research, um, there were four different species that occurred in the southwestern U.S. So um, two of them are sexual species, and two of them were triploid unisexual species that have different combinations of genomes derived from them, right? And the way, again, we thought these formed was by stepwise hybridization, the formation of a diploid unisexual, that then backcrossed with one of these uh, parents to produce opate, and then backcrossed with the other parent to produce sonori, right? And the interesting thing was, we didn't know anything about this diploid unisexual, um, but then we went and we were able to actually use our data to identify, right? This is this diploid pre-opate that I mentioned that we described, right? But what was really frustrating and also awesome was that my collaborator in Germany kept a bunch of these lizards in his lab and decided to try to cross Sonori with uh, Arizoni, the sexual parent again. And what we, he was successful in doing was creating a tetraploid um, lizard in the lab, a lizard with four different um, copies of its genome, which is which really interesting, right? Um, so even though we only know of triploid um, unisexual lip tails in nature, um, apparently um, tetraploid uh, unisexual populations are also viable, right? So um, maybe they have also just gone extinct. But what really kind of threw me for a loop was when this tetraploid lizard started producing diploid offspring, right? Essentially the same gene combinations that preopate has that we found, right? Um, essentially kind of overturning kind of this stepwise process, right? Appen apparently these lizards can kind of play acrobats, uh, acrobatics with their genomes in ways we never thought possible. And so it's much harder to understand what's going on than we um, initially thought. Um, the other thing is that we um, kind of see evidence that some individuals appear to lose some heterozygosity over time in their genomes. Um, and then the other thing we recently found um, was that some sexual females appear to be able to appear to be able to produce offspring by facultative parthenogenesis. So they typically largely reproduce sexually, but apparently sometimes they can produce um, offspring that are clones of themselves. Um, and so there's some lib uh, lability in uh, their reproductive mode within the sexual species that we didn't understand. Um, so there's still a ton to learn about whiptail lizards, and I hope you're all excited and are going to become whiptail biologists now. Um, but uh, thank you guys again for having me. I really appreciate um, being able to be here. Anthony, thank you for this amazing talk. It was so incredible. So we have time for questions. Hay preguntas? Podemos traducirlas si quieren. Si quieres. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, really amazing genetics, right? Um, so nowadays, everything seems to hybridize butterflies with lizards, humans, Neanderthals. But to me, it's still not clear how that is um, how that is an impediment to your systematics. I mean, you even describe a new species. So how is this sort of phenomena, genetic phenomena? Can you give us an example of how is that really an impediment to classify these these organisms? Sure, yeah. I mean, so I think um, the reason it's challenging is that, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so one of the reasons I think it's most challenging is because it creates a lot of complexity to how we kind of understand how a species forms. So I guess one of the ways I think about it is like, how many things do we know need to know about 
um, the genetic history of a population to understand if it's a distinct species, right? And so if we go, if we live in kind of this tree-based world where species don't hybridize, right? And I showed that um, kind of uh, illustration from De Caro's paper of kind of thinking about the divergence of a, a lineage over time, right? In the uh, process of speciation where species diverge, right? Essentially, one of the, the main thing we're interested in when we use genomic information to uh, try to understand the boundaries between species is essentially what's the divergence time, right? Because that gives us information on how long species have been separated or how long populations have been separated from each other. Um, and that informs us about whether or not we think they're distinct species, right? Essentially, if you kind of live in an evolutionary species world where you think it's it's about genet if about evolutionary lineages, our question is how long have they been separated, right? Um, and typically we haven't thought, all right, if they're uh, distinct species, they're not exchanging genes. But if we move into a world where those lineages are diverging and they're also exchanging genes, then we need to understand, it becomes a lot more complicated to ask, well, if species can exchange genes, what separates a species from a population? And then to understand that, what we really need to understand is a lot more parameters of divergence, right? We need to understand when did species diverge? When did they come into contact? How much gene exchange is going on between those populations? And so I think there's just a lot more um, complexity to understand how we can actually use genomic information to help solve taxonomic problems that were difficult with morphology. Now understanding the genomics becomes also complicated from uh, understanding the boundaries between species perspective. <laughs> uh, let's start with that. But um, I was wondering, uh, I'm assuming that sexual reproduction is ancestral? Yes. And uh, um, so is there any case of reversal from uh, as, uh, yeah. unisexual to sexual reproduction? Um. Well, uh, I, so I'll say there's a couple caveats. So one thing is, right, um, the more like kind of like, uh, you know, as she was mentioning, we're finding more and more hybridization where we look. We're finding that more and more sexual squamates can facultatively reproduce parthenogenetically. So it's possible facultative parthenogenesis is kind of an ancestral state um, to all of this. Um, although I guess that's maybe some complexity that's not too important because the parthenogenetic species actually kind of reproduce differently. Um, so I'll say... Um, Sorry, can you can you re rephrase that one more I time? I, I'm wondering if there is any reversal from. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, to sorry. Sexual. Too much. There's too much complexity in these lizards. All right. Um. So are there reversals? So mainly the answer is no. Essentially, once you start reproducing parthenogenetically, you can't reproduce sexually. And it, the main reason why we think parthenogenesis kind of evolves in these lizards is essentially because their genomes are so divergent, they can't produce. Um, they can't produce functional gametes, essentially, right? So meiosis doesn't work in a sexual way okay. because they have maybe imbalanced numbers of chromosomes. So there's no way to become sexual because you're so divergent. The only exception to this, of course, is the formation of the triploids, right? Okay. Because that is essentially a diploid unisexual female back crossing sexually with a um, male of another species to produce a triploid offspring. So if you think about it that way, you could think about that as uh kind of secondary sexual reproduction but that's kind of the end of the story they never really go back to being truly sexual so basically it's a dead end once you get to, uh a sexual pretty much yeah we think that's that's true unless kind of um you know the other the other kind of complexity is that that diagram i showed at the end there right where apparently they can continue adding copies to their genome potentially reduce the uh, the number of copies down and this actually provides a way for them to kind of refresh their genomes over time which again, not really sexual reproduction, but maybe provides them a way of kind of sticking around longer and not totally being a dead end. I just thought fish was complex, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your thank you for your talk. I was wondering uh, two things. One, uh, what is the the sex the determination mechanism in in a spirocellus? Is it uh, X Y? A ZW temperature, and also I was just wondering because that's plain ignorance. With the G statistics and phylo networks, we assume that all the loss that you have have pre-recombination, but 
um, you showed us obviously that any parental species do not have it, or likely uh, many of the of the loss that you have are under linkage disequilibrium. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't that bias the estimates of of introgression between lineages? Uh, yeah. So a couple things. So first. Um... We don't have a lot of information on sex determination. Essentially, the one thing we know is uh, that one species of whiptail was studied for this. It appears to have an XY sex determining system, um, and the chromosomes are homomorphic, so you can't really distinguish between the X and the Y. Um, but that's only in one species, so we don't actually know for sure kind of a lot about that. Adrian and I are kind of trying to work on actually using a bunch of our RADSeq data to um, learn a little bit more about that. Um, but yeah, so I think, um, your point about, um, the linkage is, um, a good one. So one thing to remember is those D statistics, um, we're only using to look at introgression between the sexual species. So we're not actually using them to understand the unisexual lizards. Um, but I agree there are like, there are, you know, in addition to that assumption, there are quite a few assumptions of, um, the D statistic approaches that I, I think are concerning, you know, and I kind of talked, we talked about this with the students on Monday, some of the different assumptions that they include, things like no population structure, um, no kind of extinct lineages having influenced the history of these lizards. There's lots of different assumptions that they have that I think probably are not met. Um, and I do get concerned that um, we are potentially detecting introgression in some cases with these statistics when it doesn't actually exist and it's kind of a false positive. Um, that is something I worry a lot about. Um, but the thing that made us feel a lot better about these results is that we they were consistent across a wide variety of approaches that we used um, and different data sets. Um, the Adrian um, actually uh, kind of started this project doing a bunch of mitochondrial DNA sequencing. And you can see that with the mitochondrial data, there's really clear um, mitochondrial integration. Essentially, you have sexual species that are really different but have the same mitochondrial haplotypes. So we're confident there is some quite a bit of introgression going on here, but I, I do agree that in any individual circumstance, um, we do need to be concerned about some of the assumptions of these D statistics. Really nice talk. Um, yeah, yeah, it's on. So uh, I guess we need to change our textbooks. <laughs> I mean, I've been teaching uh, speciation and systematics, and when you go uh, reach this part, when you explain polyploidy, the, the text says error, an error in the mitosis or meiosis, whatever process it's involved, but meiosis mainly. But it's not an error. I mean, these guys are doing it like purpose, probably, uh, probably, also because the environment seems to be two things. One that is, um, uh, the, the two things that you define, uh, something that, that is deterministic, that probably is in the genome, uh, and something uh, completely random that is probably environment. So there are two, two things that need, need to be considered. And it's part of the, your explanation. So do, do you think there's a, Cytogenetic or molecular mechanism that is determining these kind of changes in the sexuality that are uh, like a part of the genome, not only in, in lizards, but also other tetrapods? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think there's, there's a few different things, right? So one of the, like you mentioned, kind of the triploids, right? And there's kind of two issues that seem challenging to understand. One is like, the reproductive, like how do they reproduce? And the other is like more of a genome question about how do they deal with like dosage compensation now that they have imbalanced number of chromosomes? We don't know anything about the second question. The first question, like I think essentially you can think about it as this is the only way that they can reproduce, right? Like I said, there are um, their gene, the gene, when these unisexual clones actually uh, are generated, right? It's in part because those hybrid individuals cannot possibly reproduce sexually because meiosis cannot work. Like in particular, when they have imbalanced number of chromosomes, right, they can't line up along the metaphase plate during meiosis in order to create uh, gametes, right? And so essentially what is happening and um, 
is that the only way this works is that there is like an extra doubling of the composition of the genome before meiosis such that they go through normal meiosis. It's just that when they finish, because they start with kind of two times as much DNA, those eggs are diploid or triploid rather. And so because you have that extra doubling, you can get the lining up of the sister chromatids after they've doubled, after they've doubled, right? Whereas if you don't have that, there's no kind of lining up of homologous chromosomes. So essentially one, yeah, one answer is just that it's the only way they can reproduce. They cannot reproduce sexually, but there are, like I mentioned, there are like additional probably cytogenetic factors that we really don't understand. So one of the things that um, there was a biologist at the AMNH, um, Jay Cole, who studied whiptails for a really long time. And one of the things he was really interested in doing was recreating the parthenogenetic species in the lab. So he went out, collected a bunch of the sexual species that are the ancestors of the unisexuals, put them in cages together and said, let's try to create these clones in the lab to see what's going on. And he was remarkably unsuccessful. Like he could get them to hybridize, but most of those hybrid offspring are sterile. They actually can't clone themselves. And so there is definitely, it's definitely the case that there are um, kind of additional cytogenetic factors that we have no idea what is determining it. I'll, like I mentioned, like clearly there's this impact of balance where species have to be divergent enough to hybridize and produce these clones. But there are many examples of really divergent whiptails that occur in sympatry. They could, in theory, create um, parthenogenetic clones. They don't exist. So there's a lot we just don't understand. Thanks. Yeah. I have a crazy question. <laughs> um, do you have any hypothesis why the whiptails begin to form unisexual species just recently, like in terms of years? Mm -hmm. um, well, so there's a couple um, answers to that question. Um, so, um, you know, one, like I mentioned, we actually don't think it's a recent phenomenon. It's probably that they have been produced um, for millions of years. But all those species that existed a million year, of years ago just went extinct. So it's really what we're seeing is a snapshot of what was left over um, that exists that has not yet gone extinct. Um, in particular, though, another reason, like, why do we see the diversity that we see today? One of the other neat things we did with our um, phylogenetic information was kind of look at the biogeography of some of these lineages. Um, is this still? Ah, uh, all right. Well, it's not... Oh. It's not a big deal. Um, but essentially, what we see is if we kind of look at, um, there we go. If we look, so this is like a biogeographic reconstruction of um, for whiptails, right? Um, and so these are just the sexual species. And what we're looking at is how their range evolved over time. They're kind of derived from Central America, um, Central and South America, and they disperse northward, right? But what's interesting is if we look at a lot of the um, sexual species that are ancestors of the parthenogenetic lineages, those are the ones with the asterisks here, you see that they have kind of a recent range shifts indicated by these different colors, right? Essentially, there has been kind of a, a recent um, distribution change for some of these ancestors into new kind of regions, which brought them into contact with other species with which they could hybridize and, and reproduce unis, uh, reproduce to produce unisexual species. So um, the diversity we see today, I think is essentially a function of opportunity. It's just the right types of species came into contact and produced these clones. And that's kind of what um, happened recently, essentially. If there is no other question, I would like to thank Anthony for this amazing talk. Thank you guys very much again. It was really nice to be here.